Exciting uh, to have uh, to have everyone out have tonight, and just because of the great turnout, for we're gonna throw a gift card in for the number one. Uh, Woo! Uh, yeah. So I'll let them know if you get first place tonight. I'll let them know we give you a gift card inside. But thank you very much for coming out tonight. It's gonna be a great night. So thank yeah. You very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Frank. That's fantastic. I didn't know about that until right now either. So I will be playing trivia with you, even though I know all of the answers and wrote the questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, so now it's going to be my absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jeff Hall. Um, Jeff came to the observatory in 1992, is that correct? As a postdoctoral researcher. And uh, just this year in 2022, he was named executive director of Lowell Observatory. That was a trivia question, by the way. Um, Jeff has done a lot of really fantastic things for the observatory. And uh, in the past, his research has been on stellar and solar activity cycles, and particularly how the solar cycles affect terrestrial climate. Um, so today, he's going to be talking about Pluto. Um, and without further ado, I will bring up Dr. Jeff Hall. Make sure that well, I turn mine off first. So I'm going to turn mine off. Hold on. All good. OK, thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming out to uh, Astronomy on Tap tonight. Megan, do you have the clicker for me? Oh, yeah. Yep. Sorry. No problem. Okay, and I think I'm glad we're doing things in the order that we are because I'm pretty sure that answers to some of the questions are actually going to be in my talk. So I'm going to start uh, since we're pretty far from home here up in Washington instead of Arizona. I've got just a little preface to tell you a bit about Lowell Observatory in general. And then we'll switch to a little bit about one of the questions we get asked pretty much every night I'm on campus for a meet an astronomer event, which is, um, is Pluto a planet? All right, now don't steal my thunder here. OK, so to get started, first a little bit about Lowell and who we are. Uh, Lowell Observatory was founded in 1894 by Percival Lowell. Uh, he came out to the Arizona Territory uh, looking for what he believed was evidence of intelligent life on Mars, as was uh, put in one of the trivia questions. And right there is a picture of the 24-inch Clark refractor that Lowell brought to do some of the initial observations. It was installed in Mars in 1896. And that's a picture of Lowell himself there uh, on the right. Now, we are located in Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, at an elevation of about 7,000 feet, very high airs, thin air, clear sky, beautiful dark skies, thanks to the exemplary dark sky protections we have in place in Flagstaff. Um, Lowell was of the Boston Lowells. Boston is a great town. It's not the perfect town for an observatory. So Lowell came out to the dry, arid west. And Lowell Observatory, the main campus, is right here on this hill overlooking downtown. And this is a panorama I took just a couple of months ago of the campus. Um, right here is the Slifer building. This is the building. Uh, my office is right there. Uh, Nick, Nick Moskovitz's office is right about there, and right adjacent to Nick's are the places where Clyde Tombaugh, here's one of the answers, where Clyde Tombaugh worked and lived during the search for Pluto. As Megan noted, you know, the 24-inch the Clark refractor was um, sort of the earliest flagship telescope of the observatory. Our current flagship is the 4.3-meter Lowell Discovery Telescope. This is a $53 million project that we conceived in the late 1990s and put into full operations in 2015, almost uh, you know, 17, 18 years later. That's sort of the time scale on which these projects unfold. And I, I, this was an example of thinking really big. I've said many times, if this project had failed in some fundamental way, I don't think the observatory could have survived financially. The, the risk exposure was that large. We went into this project with a balance sheet of about $36 million, and this is a $53 million project. That kind of thing transforms any organization that attempts to do it. And now, because you know, we are 
we're that special kind of organization for whom one $50 million project isn't enough. You got to do two. It's twice as fun. And uh, yeah, who's, whoever wins the stress ball, I might take that off your hands at the end of the night. Um, this is the, the, the Astronomy Discovery Center. Our vision for this is basically to be the flagship of our outreach mission as LDT is the flagship of the research mission. And we intend it to be the premier destination for astronomy and formal astronomy education in the world. So we hope you'll come down and see it when it's done in mid-2020. Four. Okay. <laughs> and here is a recent construction cam image. We have a live construction cam. You can go to our website and see an up to the minute status of where it is. As you can see, the visitor experience is not yet ideal, but hopefully in about two years it will be. So with that, I'm going to switch a little bit. Um, you know, Megan showed you a picture of the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. Uh, Nick and I and the other astronomers go up there from time to time for meet and astronomer nights. And the, one of the questions we always get asked is, is Pluto a planet? Because, of course, Pluto was discovered at Lowell Observatory in 1930. The search for Pluto began with Percival Lowell all the way back in 1902, and he started be, be doing calculations uh, based on some uh, uh, supposed anomalies in the motions of Uranus and Neptune that there was a, a planet X out there, a ninth planet. And Lowell did not live to see the ninth planet discovered, but in 1928, the director at the time, V.M. Slipher, uh, reinitiated the search, and they hired this Kansas farmhand, 22-year-old Clyde Tombaugh, to come carry out the search. And he used the telescope in the Pluto Dome, a 13-inch telescope, to expose photographic plates and systematically study the sky for Pluto. And actually, in remarkably short order, Clyde found it. In a pair of images, that he took in January of 1930. And what he would do is, the, the, the technique here was take an image of one portion of the sky, wait six days, take it again, and look at, see if anything's moved. Because over the time scale of a week or so, the stars are so far away, they're, of course, they're moving around quite rapidly, but they don't appear to move. Planets closer in will. It's exactly the same effect of driving down the interstate and the signs are going by you relative to relatively stationary trees far away on a distant hill. And so Clyde found little Pluto right there. And then six days later, it had moved over to the other side of this pair of stars. Now, Clyde, of course, did not have benefit of the arrow. <laughs> and so I have always been rather... In, in awe of the diligence and perseverance and attention to detail, scanning hundreds of these pairs of plates. And Clyde, when he found this and, and double and triple and quadruple checked it, and I, every time I tell this story, I can feel myself literally getting goosebumps right now. He walked into the very office where I sit every day and said, Dr. Slifer, I have found your planet X. Now imagine this 22 year old, this is you know basically sort of the age of a grad student making a discovery like that. It must have been an overwhelming experience for Clyde. So here was Pluto in 1930, and that was pretty close to the best image we had of it until very recently, when thanks to the perseverance and vision of Alan Stern and a huge team of researchers, we decided to go there and see what it looked like up close. And here was the start of that trip in January of 2006, the New Horizons spacecraft. And the strategy here was build the tiniest, lightest spacecraft you can find that'll do the job and put it right up here at the tip top of the biggest, baddest rocket we've got in Atlas V and put it on steroids with all these solid fuel boosters and fling it out there as fast as you can. Because one of the mission criteria for New Horizons was the entire project team wanted not to be dead by the time we got to Pluto. So you want it to go really fast because Pluto is way out there at three and a half billion miles. So New Horizons went cruising past the moon in about 13 hours. It got to Jupiter in, in just over a year, or maybe it was eight hours to the moon in about 13 months to Jupiter, and then got a gravity assist from Jupiter and made it to Pluto in the, the blink of an eye of not about nine, eight, nine and a half years. And this is, uh, what New Horizons looked like, about the size of a baby grand piano. You can see the big high-gain antenna there. It's bristling with several different uh, types of instruments. 
uh, designed to do imaging, spectroscopy, so we get those beautiful high-resolution pictures, see what the surface of Pluto is made of, uh, study its atmosphere, the space environment around it, basically learn everything we can, as much as we can, about the Pluto system during this frenetic flyby when you went zooming right by the planet at about 35,000 miles an hour. And right the back here, over here, is uh, the, the power source, the RTGs. So, this was the best we had, the best image we had of Pluto from the Hubble Space Telescope before New Horizons got there. The problem you have there is resolution. A very small object at a very uh, large distance, you can't really see too much. And so that was, that was all we had. But even there, you can tell that Pluto might not be a completely boring object, right? You can see there's spots here that's a little brighter, a little bit fainter. It's not just completely uh, homogeneous, maybe boring kind of thing. But your problem there is a lack of pixels. So here is an example, a low resolution picture. You can't really tell what's going on at all. I can tell you this is a landscape and maybe you'll say, okay, that's possibly a landscape. You can see land, maybe there's sky, but the problem there is you just don't have resolution to know what you're looking at. But if you have a much better camera and much higher resolution, ah, now we can tell exactly what we're looking at. And so just the same uh, process played out at Pluto. Over the course of several hours, New Horizons flew within about 7,000 miles of Pluto, three and a half billion miles, and it went within, I think they nailed it to within a thousand kilometers of, of the, the keyhole where they were trying to get to maximize the science results, exquisitely planned to capture images of the planet, its moons, to fly through the shadow of Pluto so you could get some of those incredible backlit images like the one on my title slide. That's actually, I think, almost my favorite image of the whole encounter is looking back through this cool atmosphere with all of those layers. And so this turned into the iconic uh, heart image. Um, after the, the, all the big sort of, quote, demotion, you know, we were, we were on the, the phone with press all around the world for about 72 hours straight. You know, the, the phones were ringing off the hook and we were trying to take a very nuanced, you know, it's about science. We've got a faculty member who's the surface composition team lead, Dr. Will Grundy, we're on our way. We're, we're interested in the science and tried to really focus it on the science and not the, the really charged emotions that were circling, circulating about the, the change in status. And of course, then when we get there, it's got a heart. I mean, good, great, okay. <laughs> So, but what we learned from the flyby of Pluto is this is an incredibly interesting, dynamic world. It's not some boring little cratered, happy little ball like Mercury or something. It's, it's actually got, it's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is anybody from Messenger here? <laughs> um, um, so there's, there's this uh, young, smooth terrain. There are these, these towering ice mountains. There's cryovolcanoes. There's evidence of activity. This is far from a dead world out there in the cold, distant reaches of the solar system. So that brings up the question, what actually is a planet? Is Pluto a planet? What should you call a planet? And for the remainder of this, this little talk, I'm just going to give you some of my own thoughts on this. Obviously, this has been the subject of huge debate over the past, um, well, what is it now, uh, 16 years since the demotion in 2006 at the IAU meeting in Prague. So to start with, Let's take a very quick census of the planets in our solar system, which we're all familiar with. Here are the so-called terrestrial planets. Um, in, uh, not Obviously not space to scale, but the sizes are roughly to scale. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Um, characterized relatively high densities, solid surfaces. We're very glad they have solid surfaces, aren't we? And, and of course, one of our favorite planets at uh, Lowell is Mars, showing many of the characteristic markings that Percival Lowell uh, mistook for signs of intelligent life. Then still to scale, we can add the four giant planets, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, the giants, Uranus and Neptune, the gas giants. You can see vastly larger than the terrestrials, also much more widely spaced out. And then right here at the bottom, ah, there's little Pluto right there. Um, kind of hard to see, but drawn to scale, as you can see, considerably smaller than Earth, smaller even than our own moon. So clearly a different kind of beast. Now, now, those were the nine known planets and agreed upon as of 2005, but things had started to change in the field of astronomy regarding our understanding of, of small bodies in the solar system and around other stars. And that really began 
in 1992 with the discovery of the first of what we call the Kuiper Belt objects. And there is a Kuiper Belt object, like remember those two images from, from, from Clyde's work? Here are three, and it's awfully hard to see. There's something maybe moving in there, but it actually is in there. This is the first known Kuiper Belt object out there where Pluto lives, have the exciting and romantic name of 1992 QB1, um, and moving slowly through this star field. So there was the first glimmer that there are other things out there in what we would call the trans-Neptunian region of the solar system. In the same year, the detection of the first planet around another star. And this is, let me tell you, a happening place. Um, this is a planet, it's orbiting a pulsar, a neutron star, the dead remnant of a star that has exploded and collapsed, spinning several hundred times a second, emitting beams, emitting beams of lethal radiation. Here you are on the planet's surface. This is a lovely vacation spot, as you can <laughs> clearly see. Um, and then, at this, then, just a few years later, we found another spectacular vacation spot, the first planet known around a star a little more like the sun. And this is just an art, these are all artists' renderings, because of course we can't image things like this. Um, here is the star, this is the star 51 Pegasi, relatively ordinary uh, main sequence star in the constellation Pegasus. And this was a planet detected orbiting the star, the first known exoplanet. Now, Mercury, in its orbit around the sun, has a period of about 88 days. The period of this planet around its star is four days. So you do some basic uh, orbital mechanics and you conclude this thing's got to be extremely close to its star. So much so that the atmosphere is probably about a few thousand degrees. It's also very large, gaseous, it's Jupiter-like. And so astronomers, being the resourceful and incredibly creative sorts of beasts that they are, called this a hot Jupiter. Okay, so, so this was sort of a new class of planet. You know, we thought our solar system kind of made sense, right? You've got the rocky, dense stuff sort of sank towards the bottom. You've got the big, light gas bags farther out. That's a solar system architecture that seemed familiar to us. And here, the first exoplanet detection turned upside down our idea of what the architectures of solar systems might look like. And now, as we have discovered just a few more, we have, we have realized there are just any number of different sorts of planetary architectures out there and likely many different kinds of planets. So I looked at the Exoplanet Archive just last week recently. It's a little over 5,000 planets we've discovered from various means and various missions. You know, NASA's Kepler mission is, is a, a prime example of a, a, a groundbreaking mission in, in under, helping us understand the population of planets in the galaxy. And this plot is basically showing you the orbital period of the planet on a log scale. So here is uh, 1, 10, 100, 1,000 days. And this is the, the size of the planet in, in Jupiter radii. So 10 to the 0, that's 1, that's the radius of Jupiter. So you can see what we tend to find, 10 to the 0 is 1, 10 to the 1 is 10. This is the orbital period in days. We tend to find planets fairly close to their stars because they're easier to find that way, particularly if you're doing things by watching for transits. We also tend to find really big planets because they're easier to see particularly if you're doing things like radial velocity uh, detections where the, the reflex motion on the star is greater. The Earth is over here, this little red dot. We're looking for those. In fact, we've got a program at Lowell Observatory, at the Lowell Discovery Telescope, specifically targeted at detecting Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. We have also cataloged just scads of Kuiper Belt objects. So it's clear that Pluto is not a loner out there. It is a, a richly populated new frontier of the solar system, and many of these objects are fairly substantial in their own right. So Pluto is there. Pluto's got five satellites. We have found a number of other objects in the Kuiper Belt comparable in size. They've got their own satellites. Uh, they may be somewhat misshapen, but there's quite a population out there. So this calls into question now, what's a planet? And, and what, what's a reasonable way to think about a planet? I will tip my hand and say I don't think the current definition of a planet, I think it's got some problems, and we'll, in the last little bit of the talk here, we'll go over what those are. So first of all, let's come a little bit back closer to home and look at this beautiful specimen and how we might classify it. So this is uh, a giant silkworm moth. We were just talking about moths the other night. Where's Stephen? I told him this was going to be in my talk. 
So this, this absolutely gorgeous specimen, specimen showed up on our, our door sill about 12 years ago, one June, and my three little, at that point, very little sons and I collected it, and it, it, it's a female, which you can tell from the body size and the, the morphology of the antennae, promptly uh, laid about 330 eggs, and we spent the summer raising these little caterpillars to see if we could get the, and it is hard to keep those little buggers alive, let me tell you. Um, and I think we got about 10 to 12 cocoons out of it, and then these gorgeous new moths come out, and, and, they, and they live about a week, because this particular uh, family, they have no mouth parts, they don't feed, they just grow up, reproduce, and die. Maybe that doesn't sound so bad, actually, but... Um, uh, so anyway, um, so we all know, as we all know, in the classic Linnaean taxonomy, you, you know, you divide things into this beautiful classification tree. You have classes of insects, order Lepidoptera, meaning scale wing. Um, family, I love this, Saturniidae, named after the, the big rings that, that adorn the, the wings of these species. And, and then you get down to genus and species, the Oculia silk moth, sort of the western relative of the eastern Polyphemus moth. So this is, this is how we uh, try to understand the patterns in the world around us. Classification allows us to to sort things into things that make sense. And how do we do it biologically? Well, uh, you know, entomologists will look at things like the, the structure of the thorax or the patterns, uh, the physical patterns of the, the veins in the wings, which are like the, the ribs that give the wings the, the rigidity to, to, to function. And so, so we just base this on physical characteristics. So now let's consider, go back to the planets in our solar system and start considering physical characteristics. And we'll look at how planets were defined in 2006 by the IAU. So we have a couple of classes of planets. We talked about the terrestrials. We've got giants, and you might divide those into gas giants and ice giants, the, the planets a little farther away. And then you've got little old Pluto, which is definitely different. It's in an eccentric orbit. It's inclined. It's very, very small. It's a different kind of beast, maybe, than the others that we've seen so far. So in 2006, the IAU created a new definition of planet that has three basic components. And I think one of them makes a lot of sense, and I'm going to take issue with the other two. So first of all, the, plan, the, the definition puts the definition of a planet specifically in the context of orbiting the sun. In the solar system, a planet is this. So this makes zero scientific sense to me, um, since going back to our example of the silk moth, suppose I'm on a road trip, and it's here in Seattle, and we've decided that species is defined as being in the vicinity of Seattle, and it somehow gets stuck in my car, and I head back to Arizona, and then it gets loose. Is it the same species? Yeah, of course it is. So I think, and we know now that there are planets all over the galaxy, so constraining a definition to apply only to our solar system is awfully um, heliocentric, if you will. Then, a... Uh, the com component of the definition that I think makes a lot of sense um, is that the object must exi exist in what we call hydrostatic equilibrium, which is a fancy way of saying big enough to be a ball. Under its own gravity, it shapes itself into um, a sphere, roughly a sphere. Um, stars, the sun, exists in hydrostatic equilibrium. When you look up, you're seeing giant balls of plasma existing and, and actually shining because of hydrostatic equilibrium. So that makes sense. And then there's this third, has cleared its orbit. And that was in one of the slides, right? And so we call this um, big enough to be a bullet. So it has to have kicked everything out of its orbit and therefore is sort of clear of anything uh, that, that might be in the way. So under this definition, I would ask, is Earth actually a planet? Uh, because things occasionally hit the Earth. There's this big impact crater uh, about 35 miles from Flagstaff. In fact, you can see Flagstaff right in the distance there. Lowell Observatory is uh, right at the base, right about there. Um, the folks of Chelyabinsk, Russia, might wonder whether Earth has successfully cleared its orbit since they all got their windows blown out in 2013. So I think this, again, this is, this is a very location-specific thing. If, for instance, you took Earth and teleported it into the middle of the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt, suddenly it wouldn't be a planet anymore. Um, if it then eventually cleared the orbit, it would become a planet again. This sort of location-based classification is what bugs me. I think the most sensible thing to do is base your definition on the simplest possible physical characteristics. Then things are going to get more complicated. 
Because if you think about the numbers, depending on who you talk to, there's what, two or 300 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And we know from missions like Kepler and others that probably the vast majority of those stars have multiple planets. So simple math suggests a couple trillion planets in the Milky Way alone. In this galaxy, we've seen this new image from James Webb Space Telescope, all those galaxies in this pinprick on the sky, maybe a couple of trillion galaxies in the cosmos. Now you're up to like a few sextillion planets. Um, imagine the richness of the classification scheme that, that can be derived from that, provided you don't constrain it to one star in one galaxy. So I'm going to leave you tonight with just one, this is just, this is obviously hotly debated, just one person's opinion of how you might sensibly define a planet, and then it'll get a lot more complicated from there. It's big enough to be a ball, exists in hydrostatic equilibrium, small enough to not be a star, period. So basically, uh, what, what, is, what is the definition of a star? What is the sun? The sun is essentially the mother of all hydrogen bombs. It's basically shining by fusing hydrogen to helium in its core. Thermonuclear fusion is how stars generate their energy. Some do it more rapidly, some do it less rapidly, um, but, but that's sort of at the heart of what is leading a star to shine. So under this definition, here are the implications, uh, the moon. You could call the moon a planet. It's, it's a ball and it's not shining. Um, does that make the Earth and the moon a binary planet? Possibly. Maybe that's another little thread on the taxonomic tree of planets. Um, so in this case, we would have terrestrial planets, giant planets, maybe ice giants, and then we've got all of these. And I think it is really fair to call them dwarf planets. One of the confusing things about the IAU resolution was they decided Pluto was not a planet, and then they had to figure out what to call it. And what they decided to call it was dwarf planet which is rather confusing. And moreover, dwarf is a, a, uh, it's a term in use in astronomy, right? The sun is a dwarf star that has a very specific connotation. Um, so I think it is fair to say that Pluto is a dwarf planet. It is perhaps the archetype of a very rich class of planets that probably have many different subclassifications. And if we could build a whole fleet of new horizons and go see all of them close up, then you'd get close-up views of things like Arakoth, this little object that's sort of congealed, two little things congealed together. What if you could go out and see Haumea up close or Maki Maki? This is a, this is a plug for supporting your federal agencies that build these wonderful ships, which, uh, which Nick is going to talk about shortly, to go out there and explore the cosmos. And if we do, imagine just the richness. Go look up at the, go look at the taxonomic tree just of insects with a few million species, and then imagine that there's you know, not 10 to the 12th, but 10 to the 20th planets out there. Imagine the richness of what's waiting to be discovered when we have the time and the patience to revisit it and think about it carefully. So thank you very much. Oh, okay. Sure, sure. Oh, totally, totally. Okay, all right. Uh, so you first, then Mike. Oh, um, entirely possible. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it may well be that it simply hasn't been discovered, that it's small, it's been too faint to see. But, you know, the, the Kuiper belt has a known extent, but I don't see why there couldn't be objects farther out there. Quite possibly. I seem to remember a talk at Lowell maybe a couple of years ago where we almost didn't get anything from New Horizons. Oh. It was like oh. 36 hours before so, we lost contact. It, it, well, so it was 10 days. And, and, yeah, and, and that reminded me something I meant to say during my talk. Whoever wins Chasing New Horizons, that's, that's a really good read. And when you get to the end of that book, your basic conclusion will be it is an absolute miracle that we got any of the pictures we did. Um, because you know, just, just the, the hurdles they had to get past just to get it to the launch pad. But then, yeah, 10 days ago, um, Will would know the specifics, 10 days before the encounter, um, they, 
they sent a command and overloaded the computer system and it went into safe mode. And they had, if I recall, they had to re-upload everything. And, you know, they're going around the clock and, and Alan had, you know, backups and fail safes and, you know, he, everything was, was primed to respond if there had been a disaster. But that's particularly gripping moment in the book when, you know, this is very high profile stuff, you know, and, and everybody has spent 25 years of their careers on this and NASA has invested close to a billion dollars and the whole world is watching, right? Because when we went by, that image of Pluto was above the fold on practically every paper in the planet and it, after nine years, it goes silent, right? 10 days before the encounter. But, you know, they're incredibly smart, incredibly dedicated people and they were prepared and got it done. But yeah, it was a heart stopper. And, and actually just before, just before the, the show here, Nick and I were talking about various missions and, and how it is, it, it's a high risk business. Yeah, way in the back. No, it's probably not the actual distribution, but it's, it's, we have several different techniques for detecting planets, and some of them are optimized for detecting, you know, big things close in. Some of them will find, or planets that are close to their stars, or planets that are large and have a, a, a stronger effect, you know, and like when you look at the largest scale maps of the universe, right, you sort of see these fans extending out. But it's not that the universe exists in, in fans like that, it's just that's where we've observed and where the data are complete and where they're not. You'll see the same thing, I think, you know, if you look at maps of the Kuiper Belt, there, there are weird little things in there that are, that are I think, functions of, of where the surveys have been most thorough and where they've not. Okay, maybe one more, and yeah, go over there. What science are we hoping to do with the fancy new telescope? So the fancy new telescope is, um, it's optimized to do a wide range of projects. One of its unique strengths is what we call the, the instrument cube. Uh, so in the back at the, the, the RC focus, the Ritchie creation focus, there's this cube and you can put, uh, I see Megan is on the ball as usual and it's gonna put a picture of it. Keep on going. Ooh, goodness, that's bright. All right, there we go. So the instrument cube right back here at the business end, you can mount instruments on all five ports and then switch between them rapidly. So you can switch programs from imaging to spectroscopy and so forth very rapidly. So some of the projects we've been doing initially involve you know, deep imaging of dwarf galaxies, really faint surface, uh, surface brightness objects. Um, you know, one of the, the most relevant, I think, to my talk, this fabulous new spectrograph that Yale University provided which has ex exquisite precision, uh, we're searching for the reflex motion of Earth-like planets going around Sun-like stars. And you pencil out the math. If an Earth is orbiting a star, the star should be wobbling at about 10 centimeters per second. That's sort of the tug of things like Venus and Earth on the Sun. So you're trying to detect those level of motion, that level of motion in targets, you know, trillions of miles away. And, and complicating that fact is and this is where I get really interested in the, in, in the program, the stars themselves are these seething variable balls of plasma. And so they're constantly varying and jittering. And so for the planet hunters, that's noise. For me, that's signal. And so studying these stars and studying the sun, our astronomer Joe Lama has this cool little telescope, which he calls the Lowell Observatory Solar Telescope or LOST. And um, he's observing the sun with it to characterize how the sun varies, but what it, one of the things he's trying to do is discover Venus. Because if you can identify that in your data in sort of a control sample, then if you identify comparable signals around other stars, you gain some good confidence that you're actually, you've got a real detection. So those are just a couple of the programs, but our former director, Bob Millis, called it the Swiss Army Knife of Telescopes, because we have a, a faculty with a very diverse uh, a set of interests and we want to be able to accommodate as many programs as possible and make it useful to as many of them as we can. Okay, all right.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was a fantastic talk. Um, so now we're going to do a, a quick intermission before Dr. Nick Moskovitz gets up here to tell us about NASA's DART mission. And I'm going to tell you guys the trivia answers. And I'm going to announce the winners. Um, so I need to switch over to the trivia answers. Can you give me a second. Didn't think this through. Swipe this way. That didn't work. Oh, okay. Help me. You can do that so easy. Okay. Okay, so we're going to do the trivia answers. Got to get to the answers. All right. Okay. Um, actually, I'll grab those in a second. Okay, the first question. Lowell Observatory is home to the Clark Refractor, which is a historically famous telescope. Um, question two. Uh, Percival Lowell, although he began the search for Planet Nine, as Jeff Hall pointed out, Clyde Tombaugh was the one to actually discover Pluto. Um, Percival Lowell believed he saw canals on Mars, which led him to believe that there was intelligent life there. Um, and then starting in 1912, observations made of galaxies with a spectrograph at Lowell Observatory helped to prove that the universe is expanding. And correct me if I'm wrong here, I picked the Sombrero Galaxy because that was the specific galaxy that was observed. Yes, yeah, see, I worked at Lowell. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Lowell Observatory assisted with the Apollo moon landing by creating maps of the lunar surface. All right. Um, Lowell Observatory's flagship research telescope, the 4.3 meter Lowell Discovery Telescope, is the fifth largest optical telescope in the continental United States. Um, the Lowell Observatory Astronomy Discovery Center will be opening by 2024, and it's going to be awesome. Um, the aperture of the largest telescope the public can observe with at the GOTO is the 32-inch Dobsonian. The current executive director of Lowell Observatory is, in fact, Dr. Jeff Hall. <laughs> okay, and then finally, Pluto is demoted from planet to dwarf planet because it cannot clear out the debris of its orbital path. So... Thank you. So now I'm going to announce the winners. All right. And here's the deal. Are you guys ready for what the deal is? Okay. I have, thank you. I have 12 winners. Okay. But half of them are, are like the better winners. <laughs> That's got one more question, right? So um, about, yeah, four Five people got eight questions right, and seven people got seven questions right, okay? So here's how this is going to work. I'm going to announce the seven question winners first, then the eight question winners. Um, the folks that had the eight questions right will get to choose their prizes first. Luckily, I have exactly 12 prizes. Isn't that crazy? I did not plan that out beforehand. Um, and once I'm done announcing it, maybe um, I will have somebody randomly choose one of the eight question winners to be the ultimate winner, who will also get the Bakerson Brew House gift card. Sound good? Okay, it's random. We're going random. So, without further ado, the seven question winners, and make sure you like raise your hand or like shout something so that I know that you're here and alive. Um, oh God, I can't, I can't read this. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, I see, I see what it says. Okay, first seven question winner is Untitled. Yeah, Untitled. Very creative. Okay. <laughs> uh, the next seven question winner is Aryan Space. Anybody? Air, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. The next seven question winner is... Um, <laughs> Are gonna make me say this. Vague vagabonds. 
Anybody? Okay, way in the back. You gotta be louder than that or you don't get the prize. Um, the next seven question winner is Hermione Texas Granger. Yeah. <laughs> the next one is a uh, hypercubic tesseract, AKA Joshua. Very well, very well done. <laughs> um, <laughs> Moskowitz Chan, is that Kayla? <laughs> That's Nick's daughter, but I swear to God, she didn't have any help. I was watching, I was watching. Uh, the next second seven question winner is Parker P. Well done. Okay, and that's the last seven question winner. So you're ready for the eight, the, the folks that got eight questions, right? Okay. So the first one is IPA lot. Well done, you guys. Okay. Inner cores. Yeah. Uh, tennis elbow. <laughs> I'd love to hear the story. Oh, okay. I see. It all makes sense now. It's all clear to me. Um, the next uh, eight question winner is Team Cattern. Nice. Uh, and then finally, the last eight question winner is Grundle Hammer. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, randomize these eight question winners. Does Kayla want to pick the, the ultimate winner? Does she want to pick? Okay, we're gonna have Kayla pick the ultimate winner. You guys wanna give her a hand? Yeah! Let's pick one of these. This one, okay. Do you wanna say who it is? <laughs> it's Grundle Hammer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Grundle Hammer, we'll make a note of this. You guys get the Bickerson's gift card. So. For everybody that won the trivia, come see us at the end of Nick's talk. Don't come to me right now. Um, and so just give me one to two minutes to switch the slides over, and I will be back to introduce our final speaker of the night. Thank you. Okay, make a note. Okay, I'm back. Did you miss me? Thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our final speaker of the night, Dr. Nicholas Moskowitz. Uh, Nick came to Lowell Observatory in 2014. He is a planetary astronomer. Um, he leads the Lowell Observatory Cameras for All Sky Meteor Surveillance Project, which observes meteors all over Arizona and other parts of the US in conjunction with different groups. He also leads the uh, Mission Accessible Near-Earth Object Survey, or MANOS uh, initiative, which I think he's gonna talk about a little in this talk, right? No, oh yeah, never mind, never mind, forget I said anything. Um, and the goal, of that, <laughs> the goal of that survey is uh, to study and characterize near-Earth asteroids, um, and he also heads up the Astorb database, which is a catalog of all known minor planets and has been run at Lowell Observatory since the 90s. So he's got a lot on his plate. 
Um, and today he's going to be telling us about NASA's DART mission, which I thought about telling you guys about, and then I realized that he's just going to do it. So without further ado, again, I'm going to bring up Dr. Nicholas Moskowitz. <laughs> I think so. It's got okay. all the lights on. Perfect. Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming out this evening. You can hear me okay? Yeah? All right. So we are going to be talking about uh, the NASA DART mission, which is a very exciting mission. Um, and it's a particularly exciting time on the mission because it's coming to a head in just a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And so we're very busy on this mission. We put a lot of work into this. And I hope by the end of this talk, you'll, you'll uh, share some of the excitement with me uh, about uh, what is going to be uh, very uh, intense, uh, but uh, I think uh, a very uh, fruitful fall as the mission comes to a close. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about DART up here. Uh, it's an acronym. NASA loves acronym, as do all astronomers. Uh, DART stands for the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. And so by the end of this talk, you will have a better sense of what that actually means. Um, but this is important because it's really NASA's and the world's first planetary defense test mission. And so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about all the prep work that's gone into making this happen and what we'll learn by doing this uh, pretty cool experiment. So uh, let's start with a bird's eye view of the solar system. So this is if you were floating well above the solar system. There are all, all these planety things in here, the terrestrial planets in the inner part of the solar system, Mercury. Venus, Earth, Mars, we have Jupiter, and then there's stuff out beyond Jupiter that Jeff talked about. And then the thing that jumps out here are all these little dots. Those are our current census of the minor planets in the inner solar system. There's about 1.3 million dots in this image. There's a lot of stuff out there that we now know about, and that number is increasing every day, every month. Thousands of new objects are being discovered, and that will continue into the future with next generation facilities coming online. And we expect within the next five to 10 years, that number to jump to maybe 10 million bodies that we'll know about in the solar system. So there's a lot of stuff out there. By number, these are by far the most numerous thing in the solar system. And these are the objects that I study um, for, across various populations. But what we're going to be talking about today, and this doesn't show up all that well in the image, there's a bunch of little red dots in here. And they've been color coded as red dots because they're what we call near-Earth objects. And near-Earth objects are cleverly named as such because they come close to the Earth. And so those are the ones that we're worried about when we talk about impact hazard to the Earth. We know that things have hit the Earth in the past, sometimes very large objects, and we'd like to avoid that in the future if something comes along that looks like it's on an impacting trajectory. And that's really what DART is all about. And Jeff mentioned this in his presentation, and I love this video here. This is uh, taken in the morning of uh, February 15th, uh, 2013, over the city of, or, uh, in this, within the city of Chelyabinsk, Russia. And this driver has a nice dashboard cam that gets this incredibly framed view of this thing coming in. And this video is amazing. I've watched this many times in the talks I've given over the years. The thing that still amazes me is that this driver never slows down. <laughs> he keeps going. <laughs> you can see he just, you know, he's taking his morning drive, sees this thing flash. This thing was brighter than the, the sun. This was early morning. The, 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 for those that can see, it's about 9.30 in the morning. Uh, this was about a 15 or 20 meter body that came in, a 15 or 20 meter asteroid that came in over Chelyabinsk, Russia, exploded in the atmosphere and delivered a lot of pieces to the ground. The largest piece hit a lake and made a really cool crater. Some divers went down and picked up that thing and brought it up to the surface and it immediately broke after they put it down, which was too bad, but that piece is still intact. There were thousands of other pieces that were just scattered across the snow in the Chelyabinsk region. And so it was really easy to collect pieces of these. And you can go on eBay now and buy one if you want. They're not terribly expensive. They're all over the place, and they're no known as the Chelyabinsk meteorites. Um, fortunately, nobody died from this event. Uh, but there were thousands or over a 1,000 injuries reported. And most of those were from people realizing that there was a bright flash of light outside and running up to their windows outdoors or running up to the windows of their house to look outdoors. And the shock wave from that blast then hit and shattered the windows. So there were over 1,000 people that suffered mostly glass injuries or, in some cases, broken doors and things like that hitting people. So a lot of impact and glass shard injuries. But fortunately, nobody died. But these are the kind of events that happen, right? This is sort of 
an inevitable consequence of living in a solar system that has lots of stuff of it, stuff in it. And so we would like to do something about these things if we can, particularly if we have enough advance notice ahead of one of these impactors. And so that's what DART is about. And to quantify this, this is the most technical slide I have, and I'm going to walk through it. Um, but I get this question. Typically, I'm, you know, I'm sitting on a plane, and somebody asks, what do you do? I tell them I'm an astronomer. The first thing I get asked is, when are we going to get hit by a killer asteroid? They don't know that this is what I actually work in. And I'm like, well, let me get out my slide deck, and I'll talk you through it. And I can go through this in exquisite detail if you want. And there goes four hours of a plane trip. Uh, so this is frequency, ranging from every hour at the top to once in Earth's history. So this is how often things hit. And this is size, from one meter up to 100 kilometers. All right, so it's a log, log plot of time versus size. And the answer to how often we get hit is, well, it depends on what size. And the answer looks like that. So there you go. There is how often we get hit. And I'll give a few examples along this plot here. Um, We'll start down at the, the more dramatic end of things, and there's no way to be more dramatic than a suffering dinosaur. <laughs> and so we, we know there's a large impact feature off the Yucatan coast in uh, uh, Mexico, uh, known as the Chicxulub impact feature. Um, and we think that that was um, in part responsible for the demise of the dinosaurs, that the, the ensuing climate change from such a large impact may have had significant climate ramifications that led to the demise of the dinosaurs. Fortunately for us, and one of the reasons we're still here, is these impacts of, say, 10, 20, 50 kilometer bodies are pretty infrequent. In the case of Chicxulub, we think something like that comes along every 100 million years or so. So we're good for a little while. The dinosaurs died 65 million years ago, so we're good for a while. We don't need to worry about that. Moving up the plot, uh, Jeff showed uh, Beringer Crater or Meteor Crater. This is about an hour, outside, 45 minutes outside of Flagstaff. Uh, this is about a one kilometer impact feature. Uh, that was created by something probably in the tens, maybe 50 meter size range. These are all sort of ballpark numbers here. And we think something like this comes along every few centuries, every millennium or so. It's not terribly frequent, but it's frequent enough. And if something like this happened over a populated area in modern times, that would be pretty bad. Um, the largest impact in modern times was Tunguska. This was, again, Russia. Russia is just a big country. There's nothing about asteroids wanting to hit Russia. Uh, but this was an impactor that came in, about a 50-meter-sized body that actually blew up in the atmosphere and uh, never made an impact crater. We don't, we, to date, no convincing meteorites or rocks have been found from this impact. Uh, there's no impact crater. But the explosion was so intense that it leveled hundreds of square miles of forest. You can you know, look up Tunguska in Wikipedia, the first-hand accounts that are written down there about people that were in the area. It's not a terribly populated area, sort of Siberia, northern Russia. But the first-hand accounts are amazing of the people that were there, talking about like, their clothes feeling like they were on fire from the blast wave, the heat of the blast wave coming. And there's a really, you know, as I say, the biggest event in modern history. Um, and you know, the, this, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about the size of that object, maybe in the sort of 50 meter size range. But again, this is sort of an every few centuries, every millennium type of event. And then going down to the smaller end, we've got Chelyabinsk, uh, about a 20 meter size body. Uh, we, there's still debate about how, how often we get hit by a Chelyabinsk-like thing. It's probably every few decades, maybe every century. But it's, you know, that's starting to approach human time scales, and so we worry about things on human time scales, and so that's definitely something we'd like to consider in, in sort of impact hazard mitigation. And then lastly, uh, Megan mentioned at the top that you know, one of the things I'm interested in is meteors and a project that, that observes meteors. Uh, just about every day, we get hit by something that's like a meteor in size. So this would be like a really bright fireball meteor. Uh, somewhere on the Earth, we're getting hit by one of those right now. And so that's just sort of, you know, again, the consequence of living in a, a you know, cosmic shooting ground. Um, so this is the, the sort of landscape that we're talking about, and this talk is about DART, and DART fits right here. And we'll understand that as I go through the talk, why it fits there. And in particular, uh, the reason for focusing on this sort of size range is that it's that intermediate size range that it's not so infrequent that we don't really need to worry about it, and it's not so small that it's not going to do any damage. So DART is focused on understanding these impacts in this sort of Chelyabinsk, Tunguska, Beringer Crater size, where if we found something coming in of that size, we want to do something about it, or at least give people ample warning time to, you know, get away from the windows, duck and cover kind of, kind of approach. So that's where DART fits into all of this. So what is DART? Um, I'm going to take half a step back from that and say that DART is part of an international 
um, internationally organized effort referred to as AIDA, the Asteroid Impact and Deflection Assessment Experiment. Again, another acronym. Uh, AIDA has two parts to it. There's the DART part, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight. And then the European Space Agency, uh, ESA, has a follow-on mission called HERA. And HERA will be going to the same asteroid that DART will be visiting. Uh, it launches in 2024 and then rendezvous with the asteroid in 2026. And HERA will sort of view the aftermath of DART. And so what does that aftermath look like? One of the great things about being on NASA missions is you get really slick promo stuff. And so, that, you know, they do these really, you know, like teams of people putting these videos together. And so this is DART. This is the whole DART mission. The spacecraft slams into an asteroid, and then we look at what happens. It's a rock hammer in space experiment. All right? And so for those, you know, if there's geologists in the, in the audience, this is, you know, a, a cosmic geology experiment here. Um, there's not much more to it than that. And as I said, the DART mission is coming, coming to, to a head in just a couple of months. So the spacecraft is not going to see much life after this impact. It hits at about 13,000 miles an hour. And so our job will transition from spacecraft operations to using telescopes here on the ground to study and characterize the, the effects of this impact to understand what the spacecraft did to this asteroid that it's going to hit. And that will be the best we have until HERA arrives in 2026. So the DART experiment starts with the spacecraft. It's on its way. It's 70 something days away from impact. And then it becomes the role of observatories like Lowell and others around the world to characterize the, the outcome of that impact experiment. So as I said, DART is on its way. It launched uh, Thanksgiving Eve last year. It was a really spectacular event. It was on a SpaceX Falcon 9 out of Vandenberg. Uh, if you ever have a chance to go out there for one of the launches, it was fantastic. My daughter was there with me, and uh, she, she enjoyed it thoroughly. I would show videos, but it's videos that include audio of her and my mom squealing and screaming, going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, look at it, because it's really spectacular. It's hard not to get excited about these things, and it's really incredible to see. So launch was an suc incredible success. Um, there was uh, almost... They used up almost none of their margin and fuel, which means that they were able to addi add additional acceleration onto the spacecraft, so it's going to hit a little bit higher velocity, which is great, and more energy involved, a higher impact speed, which is cool. Um, so the experiment will be all that more dramatic when it actually hits. Uh, this is the one slide overview of DART. I don't want to go over all of this in detail, um, other than to say that you know, we had this launch last year. DART's on its way. And it's going to impact kind of a special asteroid system. This is what we call a binary asteroid, which is just two asteroids. There's a primary, the larger object, which we know of as Didymos. And then the secondary, the satellite that's orbiting around Didymos, is called Dimorphos. And so Didymos is about a 780 meter size body. Dimorphos is about 160 meters in size, so a bit bigger than, a, say, a football stadium. And the separation between them is about a kilometer. And so DART is actually going to hit Dimorphos. And so that's intentional. We, we're not trying to hit the primary. We're trying to hit the secondary. One of the reasons we're doing that is because this is that interesting size range where these are the types of bodies that hit with enough frequency that we should know about how to deal with them if we find one in the future. So this is sort of, you know, let's get, exper let's get experience on a system that, you know, is, is relatively well understood. So the mission objectives, we're going to target this Didymos system. We're going to impact Dimorphos, and that impact is going to essentially change the angular momentum or change the orbit of Dimorphos around Didymos. And we then are going to try to measure that change in orbit from the Earth with our telescopes. So that's, that's the whole mission. And as you can see here on the slide, in, on September 26, the 2314 UTC is impact. And so after that, it then becomes the role of ground-based observers like myself to follow up and figure out what happened. Um, I'll just go through this real briefly because there's a cool movie after this slide. So um, again, the top level requirements. We first have to impact Dimorphos. There won't be much happening if we don't achieve this top level requirement. <laughs> after that, we then measure the change in the orbital, or we change its orbital period, and then we measure it with telescopes like the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And all of this comes down to measuring a quantity known as beta. And beta is what we, it's, it's a bit jargony, but it's what's known as the momentum enhancement factor. So let's just go to the next movie because that's cool. 
Um, so what, what this is is a laboratory experiment. People do these kind of things. This is a hypervelocity uh, impact experiment where you have a one meter granite sphere, so you know, a one meter sphere of granite that is being impacted at two kilometers per second by a four centimeter aluminum sphere. All right, and so that aluminum bullet or aluminum sphere is coming from left to right and hitting. And then the thing that jumps out uh, literally off the sphere is all of this ejecta that's getting kicked off the backside. And that is essentially what beta is. So beta is, if you imagine in space, the projectile is coming in, hitting this object. It's going to impart its momentum onto the, the large sphere. But then all this ejecta is going to act as additional thrust coming off the backside of that sphere. And it's that additional thrust that we get from the ejecta that gets kicked off the surface that we have no idea what it actually is going to look like in space on a real asteroid. And that's the point of doing DART. Beta can be anywhere from 1 to 10, where 1 would be essentially no ejecta, no momentum enhancement, which would be sort of a weak level of orbit deflection. And a value of 10 would be you get 10 times more momentum imparted onto the body than you, you sent in with the projectile. So we've got kind of a, 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 a graphical depiction of that. If beta is 1, your spacecraft comes in, it hits, you don't get any ejecta, and you get a small change in the orbit of the body. If beta is 2, if it's bigger, you get a medium amount of ejecta, a medium amount of or orbit change. And if you get a big value of beta, like beta 4, then you get a big uh, amount of ejecta and a large orbit change. And so this is what we're trying to measure with DART. We're trying to figure out how effective is this kinetic impactor technology in deflecting an object in its orbit. How much deflection or how much orbit change can we get with a basic, you know, a high impact velocity experiment? And this is the, I should have said that the impact that we're, we're um, uh, throwing at Dimorphos here is about a factor of four, five, four, five, six bigger than anything we can do in a laboratory. So it's not like we can just hit granite spheres in the lab and scale up to big asteroids. We just can't achieve those types of energies in the laboratory. So that's why we need to do the experiment in the real world. And so that's kind of the point of, of, of DART. All right. So... That's great. That's the experiment. That's what we're going to try to do. But we have to understand the system before we change it. This is really sort of a before and after experiment. Let's look at the system beforehand, smack it with a spacecraft, and then look at the system afterwards and see what, what the difference is. And so that is where the telescopes have come in. And the unique thing, um, or one of the unique things about Dimorphos is it's uh, Dimorphos and Didymos. It's not just a binary asteroid, but it's an eclipsing binary. And so this is an artist rendition. We actually don't have resolved images or very good resolved images of Dimorphos and Didymos. So this is an artist rendition of what an eclipsing binary asteroid would look like and what the brightness of that system would look like when observed with a telescope on the Earth. And so you can see we've got a little satellite here orbiting around the primary. And as it passes in front of and behind the primary, you get these dips in brightness. And those dips in brightness are just because the light from either the primary is being blocked by the secondary or the secondary is being blocked by the primary. And the depth and the shape of those dips tell us about the, the shape and the size ratio of the two astro, the two components of the system. But more importantly, the timing between these dips allow us to use uh, the, that measurement as essentially a chronometer of what the orbit of the satellite is around the primary. So the orbit of Dimorphos around Didymos is equal to the time difference between the dips. And so we use those dips as essentially a stopwatch. We see a dip, we start the clock. We see the next dip, we stop the clock. And that tells us what the orbit period of Dimorphos is. And so if we change that, we can still use that technique to measure the before and after. Mm -mm. And so we've been using uh, the Lowell Discovery Telescope uh, actually since 2015 uh, to measure the pre-impact orbit period of Dimorphos. And so this is the LDT. Here is what one night of data looks like. This is from January of 2021. This is a, a, essentially a GIF of a whole bunch of images from that night where we're essentially just looking at a fixed star field. And there are asteroids in this image. And there's actually about 10 asteroids in this image. And it's really hard to see all of those moving um, at the sort of frame rate that I'm showing it here. But Dimorphos, or Didymos, happens to be the brightest in this field. Does anybody spot it yet? There's probably a few trained astronomers. Yep, he's got it. Yep. <laughs> it's right there. 
Okay, so for those that haven't spotted it, um, it's moving along through the star field here. And this sort of you know, blinking of images is no different from what Jeff was talking about of how Clyde Tombaugh discovered uh, Pluto you know, 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago. It's the same exact concept. And so we're taking these sequences of images, and in each image we measure the brightness of Didymos and lo are looking for those dips in light that would tell us when a mutual event or one of these eclipse events happens, when the primary passes in front of the secondary or the secondary passes in front of the primary. Um, now, I'm not going to point out the other 10 asteroids. I can't actually find them myself, but they're in there. So you can come up afterwards if you want to see them. All right, so after 20 years of observations, and I, 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 I've not been at the telescope for 20 years and I'm just getting out. Um, this is a, a sustained effort by myself, my colleagues, people around the world, collecting data um, in a sustained effort to understand and characterize the system so that the, the DART experiment can be successful. And so data have been collected in various apparitions throughout the year. We started at LDT in 2015, and essentially every opportunity since 2015, we've observed Dynamos uh, to, to measure that uh, pre-impact state of the system. And we now know that to ridiculous precision. And so I'll just put both of these numbers up here. We now know Didymos's spin period, so how fast Didymos is spinning around, to 40 millisecond precision, 0 .001, 0 0.001 hours. And we know Dimorphos's orbit period, which is the key for the mission. We now know that to 65 millisecond precision, which is just incredible that we actually can measure things to that, that high of precision. And we know Dimorphos's position very well to within about 10 degrees at the time of impact, which actually exceeds our mission level requirements by a factor of four. So we've done a really good job. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so it, it's having access to telescopes like LDT and others around the world doing the sort of slow and steady work of making sure every time we get a chance to observe that object and make sure we have good constraints on the orbit period so that DART can be a success. And it, all things are looking good so far, so that's great. Um, so we think we understand the, the system now. Now we actually have to start over. We, we've done all this hard work to prepare for the impact. Well, things are going to change now, and so we have to start over. And so I'm going to talk through the kind of timeline of the post-impact time period and the hours leading up to the impact and then what happens afterwards. So on September 26th, DART is no more. It hits Dimorphos, and the original orbit is going to be something else. And we need to figure out what that is with our telescopes, again, using those mutual events or eclipse events to uh, clock the orbit period of Dimorphos. And so let's talk through that impact timeline because this is kind of cool. This is, you know, what is going to be going on as we lead up to this impact. And so um, I'll be stepping through the various uh, key moments in this timeline where 30 days out, uh, the camera board, on board DART um, detects Didymos for the first time. So Didymos is so far away, even from the spacecraft on route to the asteroid, the camera can't even see Didymos yet. It's too faint for the camera system. And I should say that the, the spacecraft has one instrument on board. It's a camera, and that's it. I, it doesn't really make sense to put a sophisticated instrument suite like New Horizons had because, well, there's not going to be much left afterwards. Um, so the first time the camera actually sees Didymos is 30 days out. Ten days before impact, we start getting continuous coverage through the uh, deep space network, the, the, the array of radio dishes around the Earth that are used to communicate with all the spacecraft that are out there being operated by NASA and other space agencies. And so ten days out, we essentially have continue, continuous contact with the spacecraft. Eight hours out, something called the pre-terminal phase begins, and I wish I knew what that meant, but I don't. <laughs> It sounds important, but we'll be looking at the pre-terminal phase beginning eight hours before impact. And it's really at four hours out that things get really exciting because then the spacecraft goes into a fully smart nav or auto nav mode, meaning it's hands off. It, it is software that's going to be controlling the spacecraft to first uh, target the Didymo system and then figure out, okay, the fainter blob over here on the right is dimorphos, and I want to make sure I don't just hit the center of light, but I want to hit the center of mass of that body so I get the maximum momentum imparted onto that satellite. So it's, uh, that, from a technological perspective, is maybe one of the most challenging things on the mission, and the engineers behind that have done an amazing job. They're, they're running tests now on uh, binary stars that are of equivalent 
um, separation and brightness ratio of the, the asteroid. And so they're going through sort of fake impacts as if you know the binary star was what they're aiming for. And all those tests have been going well and things are looking good. So uh, it's looking good so far. So four hours out, auto nav begins and then we hold our breath for the next four hours. Um, 60 minutes out, uh, we get a detection of the, the first detection of dimorphos. So it doesn't even see dimorphos until, until an hour before impact. You're not close enough until 60, 60 uh, minutes out to actually be able to see your target, which is kind of crazy. You know, you, you have to wait till the last hour after a year long flight to actually see the target that you're going to hit. Um, three minutes out, the final downlinked images to contain all of Didymos. And I should mention that these are just artist mock-ups. These are not the actual asteroids. We don't know what the asteroids are going to look like. Um, but 60 minutes or three minutes out, we get the, the, the final download of all of Dynamos. Two minutes out, final images that contain Dynamos. Dynamos will pass out of the frame. 26 seconds out, we're now actually got a big dimorphos in the field of view, and we're resolving it with something like 300 pixels. So we've got you know, sort of a nice image of our target for the first time really only 20 seconds before we hit it. It's coming in at something like 13, 14,000 miles per hour. So this is a high velocity uh, event that's happening here. Seven seconds out, we're now really getting up close. 20 centimeter per pixel resolution. And then there's one last gasp image and we don't know exactly when this is gonna be. Is it two seconds before impact, four seconds? It's something like that. And we're gonna get something like nine centimeter per pixel resolution. This is actually a really important image, this last one that's gonna come in because it will give us some insight into what we hit, what the terrain is that we hit, because the impact will, uh, the, the effectiveness of the impact will be dictated by whether you hit something like a sandy pond of fine grain material or a large blocky boulder. There'll be very different outcome in the impact depending on which of those you hit. So we'll be very interested in seeing this last image come in right before we lose contact with the spacecraft. And so after this, we can go through these sort of mock-ups of what the timeline looks like. After that, it kind of becomes, you know, anybody's guess. And so I figured I'd tie things here to a sort of local reference. We're here at Bickerson. So let's talk about the DART impact of scale and how big the, the impact will be on the surface. So um, I believe that Bickerson's biggest fermentation tank is a 40-barrel tank. I don't know if anybody can confirm or deny that, but that's what I saw online. So let's go with that. A 40-barrel tank something like 15, 20 feet high, depending on model and, and all that. So let's pretend that Dimorphos is the size of one of these large 40 barrel fermentation tanks. That would mean then DART with solar panels. With the solar panels is the size of a, a pint can, okay? The solar panels are actually most of the size of the body. Uh, the, the DART spacecraft would be sort of this, a small, small cube at the center of this can. And so the impact, the crater that we expose on the surface would be about the size of a, a typical half barrel keg. So there's, there's your DART experiment that we, you know, that's, that's about the extent of our understanding at this point. <laughs> so this is not, not quite fly on a windshield type of impact, but it, we're not, not like we're gonna catastrophically disrupt our fermentation tank. We're just gonna put a, a keg sized crater on the surface, so. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, you know, as I said, this is very much, a, you know, planetary defense is a global topic, right? The things we talk about and the way we deal with some of these problems get very interesting very quickly when we consider some of the political ramifications of how to move an object before impact and how do you deal with that. And there are working groups that report all the way up to the UN Secretary General for exactly that reason, because it is a very complicated political issue and disaster, potential disaster management issue. But because it's such a global effort, there are a lot of people interested in this DART experiment. And one of the great things about being involved with this mission is there are telescopes around the world that are already signed up and part of this investigation team and will be contributing observations and data in the period following and leading up to the impact. So this really is a global effort. Yes, we've been involved. Uh, I think that star there is Lowell. We've been involved at Lowell and helped out over the years, but there are many other observatories as well. And this is just a list of observatories that I know about that are going to be contributing data. There probably are many others and many, many observers around the world uh, that will be getting their own data. Um, so we're looking forward to this opportunity. This is, you know, sort of a pretty unique opportunity to do an experiment like this and be able to use our telescopes for, you know, sort of the good of humanity in some sense. 
And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and finish. I like to show this slide on asteroid-related talks. Um, I, you know, I think DART is an important step in the right direction for us as a species, in some sense. You know, we are we are taking this first step in sort of planetary defense, and it's something we can certainly, you know, you know, invokes images of Bruce Willis and nuclear, you know, nuclear bombs and things like that. But it's nice to see an agency like NASA and ESA taking this seriously, doing something productive, and you know, providing a little bit more information that will help us you know, protect our fragile place in the cosmos here. So um, I'm excited to be a part of the DART mission, and I hope you all keep track of uh, what goes on with the DART in the coming weeks and months. Uh, so with that, I'll finish, and if people want, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. We'll start all the way in the back. Yep. Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head. It's really fast. It's really fast. The 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 distance to it, it was one on on, er, on on one of the early slides. The distance to Didymos at the time of impact is well under an AU. It's like a tenth of an AU or even less. So it's going to be really fast. We're probably talking uh, a minute at most. Um, yeah, so we'll get that. It's not like so more distant, like New Horizons that Jeff talked about, where it was just this, you know, you had to wait and be patient for weeks and months to get the data. We'll have the data right away. I mean, that's a really nice thing. And one thing I didn't mention is that there is a, an Italian CubeSat that's riding along with Dart right now. Uh, it's an Italian-made CubeSat. So think of like a little cereal box with a camera inside. It will get released by Dart a few weeks before impact. And it will then uh, fly by and catch a few images of the impact cone and impact ejecta. And CubeSats are always limited by the amount of data that they can transmit. But the fact that we can actually have a CubeSat operational without a mothership just tells you how easy the downlink of data will be for this mission. It's, it's something that's almost a, you know, a, it's a low risk issue for a mission like this. Yeah. On the, yes, there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the question, yeah, the question is, are you hitting it head on? Do you hit it from behind? Do you slap it? <laughs> um, so the, there, there's actually a concerted decision there. And you may have seen that the orbit period of dimorphos is 11.92 hours. If we increased that and got really unlucky, it could get to 12 hours. And for people that like to observe things in the night sky, a 12 hour alias would be the worst possible thing to deal with because every night you'd begin your telescope to look at the object and you see the exact same thing because every 24 hours you're, you're, you're opening up your telescope to, to observe. So it was a concerted decision made to decrease the orbit period so we don't get anywhere near 12 hours but instead go from 11.92 to something less. And so that dictated how the actual impact would happen. We're going to hit it head on and the intent is to hit it uh, as close to the center of mass as possible. And they have an error ellipse of something like 10 or 20 meters, which is kind of amazing that you can hit. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's a bullseye from the, at the distances and speeds that we're talking about. So, um, yeah, we'll go up front here. So the question is, when DART enters autonomous mode, does it have a lot of fuel on board to, to help target? Um, there is a fair bit of fuel on board. Um, but at that point, by the time it goes into auto nav, like, you've got to be pretty close, right? It, it, there's, there's not, it's moving so fast, and you've only got an hour to really make any major corrections, that you're not really fuel limited. That's the nice thing, is there's plenty of fuel on board to make corrections that are needed within the next hour. So there'll be a lot of fuel that gets burned up in the impact too. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah, that's true. In, in back there near the back heater. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So you're going to compare something that's happening and trying to 
Sure. Yeah, so it's a great question. So how do you generalize anything when every asteroid and every body that we visit in the cosmos is a unique entity? And it's a totally valid question. And I think the, the simplest answer to that is we have to start somewhere. The, the second order question, answer to that is that at the speeds and impact we're talking about, it doesn't actually matter too much what the detailed composition, like mineral composition is, and it's more about the structural properties, sand versus boulders. And the third level to this is that uh, of, we think that of order um, uh, half or so of asteroids in near Earth space have the same composition as Didymos and Dimorphos. So if we were to pick a representative example to learn something about these systems in this way, this is a great one to start with. But if NASA wants to fund 10 more DART missions after this, we'd be happy to, to accommodate and, and do the experiment more than once. Um, yeah, here, in front. What's the composition of the satellite that's set up because of the camera? What is the spacecraft made of? The question is, what, this, what is the spacecraft made out of? And I just, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. There, there's going to be some hydrazine in there. There's going to be some rocket fuel still in there. There's going to be probably aluminum and I don't know. Uh, we're not too worried about, um, yeah, the, the composition of the spacecraft doesn't matter too much. It's more just mass and velocity. And you know, we were limited by how much mass we could launch. That was the main constraint. Um, we'll take one more question. There's one, yes, the only person with your hand up. Yeah, so the question was about deep impact and whether anything could be learned about uh, beta and uh, impact hazard and impact deflection um, from, from those results. For those, so for those that don't know, deep impact was a, a mission, a NASA mission that uh, fired an impactor into a comet. And the objective there was to expose sort of pristine material on the subsurface of that comet um, for study in both in situ and ground-based methods. The objective there was not so much um, orbit deflection. And the impact there was nowhere near big enough to have any impact or influence on the orbit or trajectory of that comet. The scale did not work out. The comet was much larger. In addition, the, the beta that you would get from a comet is going to be dramatically different from that of an asteroid. And that doesn't mean it's, you know, it, we, we learned valid information about uh, uh, the, the impact environment of a comet. but in, the thing that's primarily different is so all the volatiles that are present in a comet, things like ices and, 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 and uh, water ice, uh, various primitive ices, as those sublimate and were heated in the impact, those are going to enhance the thrust coming off of the surface in addition to material that gets kicked off. And so you uh, might expect an enhanced beta for comets relative to asteroids. And so we have that data point for deep impact, and there have been some estimates about beta for that. And we'll get a data point for an asteroid now. And so we at least have one of each. Can you take an online question? Yes, yes. So there's an online question. Uh, does the mass of the impactor matter more than the density? Does the mass of the impactor matter more than the density? Wow. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that one. That's a tricky one. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Honestly, don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyways, I, I'll hang around. If, any, if I didn't get to anybody's question, I'm happy to hang out up here if anybody wants to come up and chat. Uh, but thank you all for coming out again tonight. I appreciate it. Okay, I know you just finished clapping, but can I get one more round of applause for Dr. Jeff Hall and Dr. Nicole? And I just want to say thank you to Lowell Observatory for um, helping us put on this fabulous event tonight. So the next Astro on Tap is going to be on August 24th. Mark your calendars now, because it's going to be good. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that if you want trivia, come see us in the front here. Come see Sam, the trivia master. Um, the eight eighters get to pick first and then the seveners. Um, and, and with that, everybody have a good night and get home safe.